I'm sure your best friend is pretty great, but I can guarantee you that they aren't pink, lovable, and talk with a goofy lisp. Hello, are you here for the sleepover? Clarence might be the true definition of what someone could ask for in a friend. He has a huge heart, cares about everyone, and wants everyone to have fun. Hi, I'm Adam with Channel Frederator, and I'm here to give you the scoop on this goofy kid and all his friends in Aberdale. This is 107 Facts on Clarence. Let's get started. Number 1. Clarence was created by storyboard artist Skylar Page. Before working on Clarence, Page had served as a storyboard artist on both Adventure Time and Secret Mountain Fort Awesome. Number 2. In 2012, Cartoon Network had their own shorts program to test out potential new series for the network. Clarence just so happened to be a part of this program, and it became a hit. Number 3. Page and his classmate from CalArts, Nelson Bowles, who would later become the creative director of the show, only had a handful of people to create the pilot episode. The pilot was created by less than 10 people, and it took a lot of hard work and polishing to have it ready for Cartoon Network shorts. Number 4. In December of 2012, Cartoon Network officially gave Clarence the green light. The network ordered 12 15-minute episodes to be aired for the first season. Number 5. Cartoon Network loved the show and upped the original episode order. Season 1 had a whopping 51 episodes to its name. Go Clarence! Number 6. The first episode aired in April 2014, and was titled Fun Dungeon Face-Off. It's about Clarence stealing Jeff's fries in order for Jeff to have fun in the play area of the restaurant. Number 7. The premiere was met with positive reception. Whitney Matheson of USA Today praised the show for blending optimism with surreal humor, and encouraged parents to watch it with their kids since they would both enjoy it. Number 8. Page wanted to create a character that reflected who he wanted to be growing up. When he created Clarence, he wanted a character that had flaws, but always saw the positives in life and never tried to let anything get him down. Page felt like there was a drought of realistic stories being created. That was one of the biggest reasons why he wanted to create a show like Clarence. Number 9. Page was the original voice for Clarence during Season 1. The crew wanted to have a kid's voice for Clarence, but they could never find the right actor for him. Almost all of Clarence's friends are voiced by kids, though. Number 10. Though the majority of the children in Clarence are voiced by actual kids, out of the three main characters, only Jeff is voiced by a kid. He is voiced by Sean Jambrone, who also plays Adam Goldberg on The Goldbergs. Number 11. Paige and head writer Spencer Rothbell wanted Clarence to be a show that highlights a lot of their favorite childhood memories. The biggest advantage was that they could write these memories to work out in their favor and make them much more interesting for the show. Number 12. For Rothbell, a lot of his inspiration draws from comics that he read growing up. Some of his favorites were DuckTales, Archie, and Mad Magazine. Number 13. Rothbell also acknowledges that there are a lot of shows and movies he has seen that inspire him when creating episodes for Clarence. Some of those are Strangers with Candy, Napoleon Dynamite, and Welcome to the Dollhouse. Number 14. When creating the show, Paige wanted to make sure that the show felt grounded. He thought that too many cartoon shows allowed magic to drive the plot and let the characters get out of situations too easily. His team continues to try to keep the show, well, as grounded as a show like Clarence can be. Number 15. To make a cartoon work, you do need a little magic in there, and Paige knew this. While he did want the show to feel more grounded, he wanted there to be a little bit of surrealism as well. He has described the show as a little taste of reality in a sea of fantasy and non-realism. Number 16. When it comes to censorship on the show, Cartoon Network is very hands-off and lets the crew do what they want, for the most part. Rothbell has noted that sometimes they may need to tone down a joke or a moment, but he realizes it's usually for the best. Number 17. Rothbell writes the show to have both parents and kids laugh. He hopes that he's able to achieve what Pee Wee's Playhouse did in that there may be jokes that sometimes kids don't get, but parents will actually end up laughing at it. Number 18. Though all of the characters look vastly different from one another, Bowles argues that inconsistency is sometimes the key to consistency. When developing the show and staging the art direction, Bowles did not want the characters to have a Simpsons effect where every character has the same look and feel, like it's a shared universe. Number 19. The show has their main characters, of course, but Paige wants to create background characters to feel just as important. Whenever a background character is on screen, Paige wants to make that character feel like they are the star of their own movie. Number 20. When designing the characters, Paige wanted to make sure they felt real. He felt that Hollywood always casts or creates the most beautiful people in either live action or animations. For Clarence, he wanted to make sure everyone looked the opposite of what the Hollywood beauty standard was. Number 21. Almost all of the characters in Clarence are based off of people in real life to some extent, except Clarence. 
Clarence. Paige believes that Clarence is too pure and good of a person to be based off anyone in real life. Number 22. Sumo is actually based off of one of the animators that works on the show. Paige's cousin's nickname was Sumo and he was a skinny, weird animal kid. Number 23. Rothbell wanted the three main characters to have their own unique family backgrounds. He wanted to have representation of various backgrounds since he knew kids of various families were watching the show, and he wanted them to feel included. Number 24. One of the more interesting ideas of Clarence is that it represents more lower income families, and that is by design. Rothbell noted that the only really wealthy kid is Belson, and he is kind of a brat. Rothbell wanted the kids in the show to make their own fun, and not have to worry about constantly playing video games or any other things that involve money. Number 25. Belson is actually named after one of the producers of the show. He is named after Nelson Bowles. Number 26. Rothbell knows that kids are a lot smarter than most people think, and he doesn't want to preach to them in Clarence. Rather, he just wants to present a set of ideas and situation, then let kids decide for themselves what they mean. Number 27. Rothbell wants the show to feel more planned out with each season, and to have a sense of balance for each episode that features a certain character. He has admitted that he feels the more serious episodes are usually sumo-centric, while the wacky and silly ones are Clarence-centric. But he does continue to make each character have emotional curves and unique episodes attached to them. Number 28. Season 3 has started to have more continuity and not feel like each episode is separate. Rothbell tweeted out that he's excited for Season 3, and noted that people should watch the episodes in order once they premiere. Number 29. One thing Rothbell is looking forward to in season 3 is the concept of world building. He's glad that the first two seasons allowed for all these characters to develop into interesting enough people, and he wants to give some of them their own dedicated episode in season 3. Number 30. Some of the characters that are getting more attention in season 3 are the adults. Clarence's mom is expected to get her own episode, and Rothbell is excited about the potential of fleshing out the stories of the adults in Clarence's life. Number 31. When it comes to balancing out the future seasons, Rothbell hopes that the writers will be able to explore more about Clarence as a character. The show works so well because of the fact that there are so many characters, so even though Clarence is the title character, he's not always in the spotlight. Number 32. While there are more serious episodes of Clarence, Rothbell wants the show to feel more upbeat whenever possible. His biggest goal for the show is to capture the essence of being a kid again, which includes all of the good and bad times. Number 33. Rothbell doesn't have a favorite character to write for, but he has admitted that Jeff, Clarence, and Sumo are the characters who come the most naturally to him. He also loves writing for Belson because he can take a bit more cynical of a stance when it comes to writing for him. Number 34. Rothbell wants the show to feel like it can be accessible to anyone. He said the show has a little bit of everything, from subtle film references to bizarre narrative-driven stories. Number 35. When it comes to writing an episode, Rothbell never wants to pander to any type of person in particular. He just wants to write what is funny and not write something because he thinks it'll be funny for a specific demographic. Number 36. In July 2014, Paige was accused of sexual assault by Emily Partridge, a storyboard revisionist on Adventure Time. Cartoon Network immediately fired Paige, and soon after, similar allegations against him began to surface from other women at the company. Number 37. After Paige's removal, Cartoon Network decided to continue on with the show, which was still in its first season. Number 38. The showrunner role was given to storyboard artist Stephen Neary and Rothbell took over voicing Clarence. Rothbell had done Clarence's voice in the past for placement reasons, but never had his voice in an episode. The network auditioned over a hundred people, but couldn't find the right fit. Rothbell eventually auditioned and got the part. Number 39. Rothbell was nervous at first to take on the role because he wanted to put his own take on it. He admits that it was tough at first, but now he feels more comfortable than ever playing Clarence. Number 40. Growing up, Rothbell never thought he would become a voice actor. He would do impressions of some of his favorite Saturday Night Live characters, but he never thought of making a career out of it. Number 41. Rothbell does have a secret trick when it comes to voicing Clarence. If you're having trouble at home pulling off the perfect Clarence voice, try sticking your tongue on the roof of your mouth while doing the voice. Works for him. Number 42. Rothbell has done such a solid job at voice acting that the recording studio sometimes will ask him to do a side character. Oftentimes, he'll be asked to record a new character while he's in the recording booth. Number 43. 
1993. When it comes to recording the characters, Rothbell does his best to have all of the voice actors record together. Sometimes the actors will do a little improv, and having them all together allows for a more dynamic energy. Number 44. Rothbell feels there is a benefit to being both a writer and a voice actor for the show. He's able to understand the context of scenes really well when he's performing, since he either wrote the scene or approved it. Number 45. A lot of the show's characters and settings draw from Rothbell's actual life. Clarence's grandmother is from Florida, and so is Rothbell's. Mrs. Baker's cat is named after the cat he knew from his childhood apartment complex. And the episode Goose Chase is based on an experiment where Rothbell was chased by geese at a park. Number 46. After Paige left the show, someone else needed to take the torch of being the showrunner. Ultimately, that role went to storyboard artist Stephen Neary. Number 47. Neary has worked in the animation world for both film and television. Some of his more notable works are the Ice Age series and and the Peanuts movie. Number 48. One of the big inspirations for Neri is the work of the Coen brothers. He appreciates how they are able to create their own worlds that have their own sense of mythos and laws. Number 49. Neri actually got his first break in the animation industry as an intern for the original Teen Titans series. When he wasn't being a master photocopier, he spent a lot of time studying the storyboard for the show, and he tried to take in as much information as possible about the whole process of making a show. Number 50. Between filmmaking and television, Neary prefers to work in the TV world, but notes that it is much more difficult. For film, he acknowledges that creators have much more time to flesh out sequences and create new ideas. Number 51. Neary loves working on Clarence because of the fans that he's able to meet at conventions. Sometimes kids will tell him the show is dumb, which he always sees as a compliment. Number 52. The process for making an episode of Clarence is pretty dang tough. The writers have to pitch a premise to Cartoon Network, which they have to approve of. The writers then break down the story and think of the jokes to add. Then the storyboards start happening. Then they cast for the episode and start doing recordings. Then they ship out the boards and all of the assets to Seiram Animation who handles the animating. Then they finally get an episode back and edit it down and add in all the necessary sound effects. Number 53. Rothbell is grateful that the process is this long. A lot of animation shows can do their animation in-house and have it done quickly, like South Park. But Rothbell loves the process of hand-drawn animation and believes believes it's that extra detail that gives Clarence its unique look. Number 54. Rothbell loves animation so much that he dedicated an entire episode to be a Fleischer Studio-esque style. The episode was a huge homage to the old school animation style, so the art department had to redesign every single character in the episode. Number 55. Character designer Callie Franchio actually worked on Disney shorts before, so they had an idea of how to purpose the episode. She said that the biggest inspirations for the episode were Silly Symphonies, Betty Boop, and Flip the Frog. Number 56. When creating the episode, Rothbell wanted it to have a purpose as well. To him, the episode is meant to show how Clarence views the world, and of course, he sees it in the cutest way possible. Number 57. Neary was excited about the idea of making an episode in this type of animation style. He admitted that the crew wanted a bunch of old-timey cartoons to get into the mood for the episode, and that he loved this type of animation because it allows for so many rules to be broken. Number 58. In season 2, completely composer Simon Panch Rocket created a song called Missing You. The song is meant to be a generic pop song that random people listen to in their headphones in various episodes. Number 59. The original animatic for the opening sequence featured more boogers and was just a bit grosser. But the original theme song, also composed by Simon Pan Rocket, has always been the same. Number 60. Simon Pan Rocket actually had to create an original song to get the composer gig on Clarence. His first song? It was Hit the Pinata, of course. And by making the catchiest song ever, he got the job. Number 61. The studio has a Clarence crew sketch wall that anyone can draw on. Sometimes crew members will leave little positive notes about how much they love the crew they work with. Uh. Number 62. It's safe to say that the Clarence crew has a lot of fun at work. In their downtime, they even put together a sweet Clarence puzzle in the name of teamwork. Number 63. The crew loves Clarence so much that they even have their own Tumblr dedicated to showing off cool behind-the-scenes stuff. The Tumblr, of course, aberdaily.tumblr.com, which is named after the school's newspaper. Number 64. One of the core philosophies of the show is to treat the background characters with 
care. The writers want them to be the star of their own movie. In Clarence, everyone gets to hang out, and the world gets bigger and bigger too. Number 65. In the episode Clarence's Millions, Clarence has a dream that parodies the opening sequence of DuckTales. Not only does he jump into a pool of his newly made millions of Clarence dollars, but the sounds of the music playing are very similar to that of the DuckTales theme song. Number 66. Belson is voiced by Roger Craig Smith who is a pretty super-powered guy. He has voiced Captain America, Sonic the Hedgehog, and as Low Auditor from the Assassin's Creed games. Number 67. In the original pilot, Belson and Suma were both voiced by Jason Marsden, who you might remember as DJ's boyfriend Nelson in Full House. When the series was greenlit, Roger Craig Smith and Tom Kenny took over the voices of Belson and Suma. But don't worry, Jason has gone on to voice many more awesome characters we love, like Felix in Kim Possible, Chester in the Fairly Odd Parents, and Cade Burns in Transformers Rescue Bots. Number 68. The episode Sneaky Peaky is based off of the events in 1998, where Star Wars fans went into movie theaters and purchased movie tickets just to see the trailer for Phantom Menace and walked out before the actual film screening began. Number 69. You can see Clarence's name in Say Uncle, the crossover episode between Steven Universe and Uncle Grandpa. He is also referred to in the Steven Universe episode Onion Friend, since he looks a lot like the young version of Yellowtail. Number 70. Jeff appearance is based on the video game character Steve from Minecraft. Number 71. Sumo loves making his own crazy meals. One of his favorites is the blood burger, which requires taking a Rough Riders burger and smothering it entirely in ketchup. Number 72. Jeff isn't the biggest fan of Rough Riders and only likes their fries. He likes their fries so much that he threatened Clarence once, saying that he would pee in public until Clarence promised not to touch his fries. Number 73. Clarence is friends with almost every single person and animal in his town. The only animal not to like him is Victor, the cat. Number 74. Jeff and Clarence have mad skills when it comes to laser tag. They were able to beat Belson and all of his friends in laser tag with just a laser pointer and mini disco ball. Number 75. Clarence thinks almost all milk is gross, but he does have one favorite. His all-time favorite milk is skim milk, which, hey, Clarence, if that's how you want to roll, then all the power to you. Number 76. As with most moms, Clarence's mom loves coupons. Like, really loves them. She saves coupons for a whole month and then goes to town with them at the grocery store. Number 77. When Clarence's mom isn't busy couponing it up, she's styling up people's hair. She works as a hairstylist for the Hips Clips Salon School. Number 78. Clarence loves the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Well, sort of. In the episode Clarence's Millions, you can see what appears to be an action figure that oddly resembles a turtle who may or may not love pizza. Number 79. One of the three main characters, Clarence was the first one to get a girlfriend. Jeff wasn't too thrilled about this because he sees himself as the ultimate ultimate nice guy, even if he won't hold doors open for people who are carrying books. Number 80. Jeff loves toys, and that's no secret to anyone, but he also loves He-Man. <laughs> At least the He-Man that lives in Clarence's universe. In the episode Jeff's New Toy, an action figure of what appears to be He-Man can be seen on Jeff's toy shelf. Number 81. Sumo has a bunch of siblings, like a bunch. He has 11 brothers and one sister. It probably stinks pretty badly at Sumo's house. Number 82. Jeff actually has two moms. Their first appearance is in the episode Jeff wins, and they love him immensely, even when he is afraid to enter baking contests. Number 83. For whatever reason, Clarence's principal has a cartoon face, but his mouth is an actual human's mouth. Number 84. The kids have done their fair share of gross things, but even they get grossed out sometimes. In the episode Too Gross for Comfort, all of the kids share their grossest stories. For Clarence, the grossest thing that happened to him was that when he was feeding a goose and one day it vanished. All that was left was an egg, which he poked, and then a bunch of green slime exploded on him. Ugh, yeah. Number 85. For Amelia, the grossest thing for him happened when he was trying to scare his sister. He was hiding in her closet, scared her, and she slammed the door on his foot. All of his toenails broke and there was blood everywhere. Pretty dang gross. Number 86. Julian's grossest thing happened to him when he was on a trip to Belize. He was having a fun time until he was rushed to the hospital, only to realize a worm had gotten inside him and tried to lay eggs. These poor kids. Number 87. Jeff's grossest story is, uh, well, only 
probably a little gross. He was taking a shower when all of a sudden the drain stopped working and he almost touched contaminated water. But then the drain worked and he was a-okay. Number 88. In Jeff's flashback of his grossest story, the sequence plays a subtle nod to Mr. Alfred Hitchcock. The sequence is shown in black and white and shot almost exactly how the psycho shower scene plays out. Number 89. Sumo's story is just unfortunate. His family was on a road trip to visit his grandparents and stopped at a seafood place for food. The bad part was that the closest body of water was about 200 miles away. So, uh, the fish wasn't exactly the freshest and a lot of the kids got sick on that trip. Number 90. Sumo also may like to fake stories every now and then. In one of his other gross stories, he was a guy who just so happened to look like Han Solo, who just happened to rescue his friend, who just so happened to need to go into an animal for warmth. Number 91. Chelsea's story was one of just wanting to enjoy a trampoline. Unfortunately, she ended up doing one flip and broke her arm so bad, you could even see her bone. Number 92. Despite all their gross stories, there was only one thing to truly gross them all out. In the heat of a debate, Chelsea and Sumo kissed, like on the lips. <laughs> Number 93. Clarence has only really been sad once in his life. It happened in the episode Little Buddy, where Clarence had to bury his favorite toy, Lil Buddy. After burying him, Clarence, uh, well changed. Just a bit. Number 94. In the same episode, there's a subtle nod to the Toy Story series. The song that plays during Clarence's downward spiral to sadness sounds awfully familiar to Randy Newman's Strange Things that appears in the first Toy Story film, when Woody is slowly getting replaced by Buzz Lightyear. Number 95. Lil Buddy makes another small cameo in the Clarence short, Beans. In the short, Clarence tries to cheer up the neighborhood dog, Beans. In one attempt, he throws his Lil Buddy doll at him, but Clarence can't seem to remember exactly what the Lil Buddy doll is. Number 96. Jeff might hold some similar traits to a certain Patrick Bateman. In the episode Average Jeff, Jeff narrates his morning routine in the way a certain person would from a certain movie. I stay on routine on schedule. Number 97. Charlie Brown lives in the Clarence universe. Well, kind of. There is a kid named Brady who goes to Clarence's school, and he sounds extremely similar to Charlie Brown, and even has an internal monologue. Number 98. Clarence happens to be a master comic artist. In the episode Freedom Cactus, Clarence revives the school's newspaper by making a comic strip about a farting cactus. Number 99. Mr. Reese was a huge supporter for the farting cactus. Clarence, this is a masterpiece. To the point where he made his own shirt. The crew for Clarence actually made their own real life version of this shirt. Number 100. Clarence has his own means of relaxing while being on a plane. One of his favorite things to bring with him is a cute little Q-Pie baby toy. Number 101. Clarence isn't the only one who likes super adorable things. Apparently, Belson is a fan of the show Adventure Time. In the episode Belson Sleepover, you can see what appears to be a stuffed animal of Jake the dog from Adventure Time. Number 102. The episode Bucky and the Howl has a reference to the movie Election. When Sumo is freaking out about the show and starts tearing down the posters for it, the sequence is almost shot for shot a remake of the scene in Election where Reese Witherspoon's character does the same thing. Number 103. One episode has Spongebob getting detention from Patrick. Okay, okay, it's their voice actors. In the episode Dreamboat, Sumo, who is voiced by Tom Kenny, Spongebob, is getting lectured by Mr. Reese, who is voiced by Bill Foggerbach, Patrick. Number 104. Miss Baker did not actually start off with that name. Originally, it was Miss Burstein but was then changed to Miss Burnett, only to be changed again to Miss Baker. Number 105. The crew of Clarence turned a game from one of the episodes, Time Crimes, into an actual game in real life. The episode features a game created by Belson called Belson Ball, and the only rules are the ones that Belson made up. Number 106. While Clarence has not won any big awards, it has been nominated for some impressive ones, like an Annie Award, which is basically the Emmys for cartoons. Number 107. Clarence wrapped up season two on February 3rd, 2017, with the episode Pizza Hero. The third season premiered on February 10th with the episode Sumo Goes West. That's only one week in between seasons. It's safe to say that the Clarence crew is hard at work all year round. Thanks for watching 107 Facts About Clarence. Which one of his friends is your favorite? Which episode? Comment below and let us know. We have new videos dropping every week, so let us know which animated film or TV show you want us to cover next. And if you like getting more from your cartoons, subscribe to Channel Frederator, your cartoon central on the internet.